varieties. But then they are combined that none of it on its own value is specific to a face whatsoever. But gazillions of these features, when they are combined, in fact, do detect human face just by kind of cumulative force of extraordinarily crude elementary uh, detection principles. And I mean, to me, it's really amazing that something like that can work. And I really admire whoever tried to do it that way. Uh, but, and similarly, in speech recognition, this is an extremely crude initial model. But it can be used bringing in higher level features to, um, to um, eventually produce what Siri does, namely almost perfect uh, uh, speech recognition. So this is just the initial uh, building block. OK, so now what is hidden Markov model? Hidden Markov model is the following. And among other things, uh, it is, well, let me just first tell you what hidden Markov model is. So hidden Markov model is precisely that. You see, you have some process, uh, me uttering uh, uh, phonemes, uh, right? And then lines, uh, you know, walls, and then uh, phoneme L, phoneme A, phoneme V, and so forth, right? But you are unable, you don't have direct access. Because when I talk to you, you don't know which phonemes I am uh, uttering. You can only hear the wave, sound wave, that is caused by my utterance. And this uh, uh, sound wave has lots of variations from speakers to speaker. So, it is not clear, so, so what you can do, the best what you can do is, uh, you can extract features, uh, so, uh, so this is F1. So what are the features? So maybe I should draw it. Uh, you, 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 you can hope to break this into uh, waveforms out here because it's silence. It will be only some amount of noise, right? And then here it will be L, whatever it looks like, and then R, right, and so forth. Then uh, from here you can extract features. And this is done, as I say, in frequency domain. Uh, so this is a vector because usually not usually, you always extract quite a lot of different features to kind of uh, um, increase the probability that you will correctly decode. So this is a Markov model of a quote-unquote, of course in real speech it is not completely random sequence of uh, phonemes, but at the moment we approximate it by that. But you have no access to these. You have access only on these measurements, uh, or processed measurements, uh, which are manifestations of the states. But uh, the recognition is tricky because does this come from I, or does it come from I? You see, the difference in sound between these two is very small. So for a given vector, you can only assign probability that this feature is in fact caused by a particular phoneme. Right? So for example, in uh, 
Serbian, we don't have this sound, right? So I usually simply replaced it by plain T, right? But Siri somehow successfully manages to, to understand me. Uh, but you can see uh, why the, Mar so the Markov chain of real objective events is hidden from you. You only have measurements that you might process to extract feature vectors. So these are, in fact, here these would be the observables, the individual waveforms, or after processing, then become they become feature vectors. So, yes. Uh, with the observed samples, do we also uh, vary probabilities? Uh, so for f, yes. dependent on what f one. Very is. good. Excellent. So now the hidden Markov model is not. Uh, just, uh, so what did we say uh, for a Markov uh, chain? Uh, do I have it on the other board or did I erase it? I did erase it. Well, we have the set of states. Up to SK. So this is a uh, uh, set of all states. In our example, it will be set of all phonemes. Then we have initial probabilities, uh, pi 1, pi 2, up to pi k. So initial probabilities. Uh, in the case of Mark of a, a random surfer, these were all one over n, right? Because all web pages, we start assuming that the, the random surfer picks a web page randomly with equal probability. But in general, for example, phonemes uh, uh, for a, for a beginning of an utterance, of course, some phonemes will be more likely, some will be less likely. Then you have the uh, matrix M, which is the prob uh, pr set of probabilities that from state SI we transition into state SJ. So here IJ range between 1 and K. Then we have another set, uh, which can be actually uh, much larger than M, you have set of observables. Uh, so uh, this will be O1 uh, observable O2 up to observable, uh, say, uh, whatever uh, M or N, it doesn't matter, right? So these are all possible observables. For the speech, this can be, you can, for example, call observable this processed waveform, so they will be the feature vectors, right? All possible things that uh, you can get by extracting features. So if I speak by the very same sentence, these feature vectors will be different from what, how you sound when you speak. And so, O has to be pretty large. It has to be large enough to incorporate uh, the observables for a large, kind of for all, reasonably large representation of all possible speakers, right? So these are the observables. And then you have a, a matrix E that is called the emission matrix. And uh, this is the matrix of probabilities uh, that if you are in a state uh, SI, uh, observ observation will produce observable, um, uh, okay, so probability that if you are in a state SI, you will get observable O uh, J, right? Now, I ranges between uh, 1 
and k, but j ranges between 1 and whatever cardinality of this is, say, n. So that precisely answers your question. For every possible observable, for every type of feature vector, uh, sorry, for every phoneme, there will be a collection of feature vectors, uh, different feature vectors uh, that co might correspond to that spoken phoneme, but with different probabilities. Uh, so this is what you get. Uh, so uh, you have something that you cannot see, right? But you can do by searching through a large corpus of examples, you can compute the probabilities of transition from one phoneme to another phoneme. And this is highly specific for, uh, for uh, each particular language. Uh, for example, uh, phoneme and NH, uh, right? It's uh, absent in most uh, Indo-European uh, languages, but it's ubiquitous in Semitic languages, like in Arabic and Hebrew and so forth. Uh, so, um, so now what you have, uh, so this is what's happening in my head. I'm thinking of an utterance. I'm producing some sign sound waves that you parse into feature vectors. I know the probabilities of transition from uh, one phoneme to another. And I know for every phoneme, what's the probability that I'll get any other observable. So, for example, from the phoneme A, probability to, to confuse it with the phoneme K is extremely small, maybe even zero, right? So, but uh, to, to, uh, you, you can easily confuse, uh, if I speak, uh, you can easily confuse uh, these two phonemes, right? So uh, probability, if uh, the, the, at the end of the algorithm is uh, T A is up here, by the end is uh, T H, right, uh, which is denoted as theta, then the phoneme that corresponds to T uh, will have large probability, but the largest will be presumably the phoneme, the correct phoneme. But there is no one to one mapping. For every phoneme, you have multitude of possibilities. This happens, for example, also when you do DNA sequencing. So you have a chunk of DNA. You cannot look and see what base pairs are there. What you do, you run it through a sequencing machine. right? But sequencing machine can make errors. right? But what you do know, uh, and you know what kind of errors, uh, what kind of uh, uh, base pair can be confused uh, more likely with, with another base pair. But so you have honest to God sequence of base pairs, and here you have the outputs of your sequencing machine, and lo and behold, there are quite a few errors, right? In both cases, like with speech recognition, and with your sequencing machine. What do you think? What, which interpretation will you take as the, uh, as uh, which interpretation will you take as an operational assumption? So you have a sequence of observations, right? And you want to deduce what is the sequence of honest-to-God states of Markov chain? Not all sequences of Markov chains will give these observations with equal probability. Right? So here, probability that I will confuse and get K 
and then uh, space, and then here B, uh, will be very small, right? So which among these uh, will you pick? What do you think? OK, let me give you an example. Assume I have a coin, and I toss it. It's a fair coin. It's 50 chance, 50% 50 chance it will be head, 50% chance uh, it will be tail, right? So when, a coin, when I have a coin, I can have probability for the outcomes for this coin. But I can turn things around. Assume I give you the sequence head, 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 tail, head, 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 tail, head, head, tail. And I ask you, which coin is the most likely to produce such an outcome? What do, how would you solve this problem? So you get head, 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 tail, head, 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 tail, head, head, tail. Is this very likely to come from a fair coin? No. no. What is the coin that is most likely to produce this outcome? One of famous heads. Exactly. So you simply count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine heads and three tails. So it is nine over uh, 12 probability of head and just uh, uh, just 3 over 12 probability of tail, right? Why, did I, why do you think this one is the best guess? Because this coin is the most likely, as we will see soon, to produce such outcome. For coin like this, probability of this outcome will be the largest. And so, if it's most likely, it's natural to take it as a working assumption that that's the correct answer. So here, if I tell you the sequence of observations, which sequence of states of Markov chain will you guess as the, as the best guess for this outcome? The one that adds uh, up, the one that Exactly. So it will be the one that has that that uh, that uh, makes this outcome the most likely, right? So, from uh, for example, for something that starts with k and b, the probability to have such outcome will be very slow, very small. But uh, uh, we always pick the as a guess of what happens behind the screen here, but which we cannot see, we simply find this sequence of states for which the probability of seeing these outcomes is the largest. <coughs> now, you would not only pick the probability, the one that the probability is the largest, but maybe you will pick top 10. Right, uh, the uh, top 10 uh, runs of the Markov chain that will be the most likely. Among these 10, how will you decide which one to adopt in a second layer of processing? Possibly semantics. Semantics is, uh, uh, that's the hardest part, but just before it's kind of semantics, but uh, what would you? Uh, probably. So you have uh, a range of observed values. So you look at what the, the first observed value, map, what's the probability of the first observed value mapping to the second? Assume that, yeah, you compute all the probabilities and say, uh, I get that the top one is uh, 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 the sequence that looks like this, uh, right? And then the second. Uh, uh, or say that this is the second, the first is, uh, that turned out to be the most likely. And the third is, uh, uh, 
out or one that makes like the most grammatical sense in the English? How do we know which sequences of uh, utterances uh, we will look it up in a dictionary? Yeah. Right? So then, once you get those that correspond to words, uh, then you go to semantics and you look grammatically which one of them is uh, most likely grammatically correct. So just like with face recognition, you start with a crude model, but then you build refinements on top of it that eventually get you over the hump to get a correct uh, solution. Right? But the basic start that this guy introduced is a hidden Markov model, right? And what I want to show you now is a beautiful application, and it's probably the first application uh, that uh, you will see of uh, dynamic programming that is really used in practice, and it used with such ubiquity that uh, it's um, that is uh, really, really only things like uh, fast Fourier transform are used uh, most often. So I will show you something called the Viterbi algorithm. And Viterbi algorithm is used. Uh, what is the algorithm? The algorithm is precisely this: when you are given Markov chain with states and probabilities, and the state of observable with their corresponding <laughs> probabilities, it tells you, given a sequence of observables, what is the most likely run of the Markov chain to produce that sequence of observables. This is used, for example, in mobile phone networks because you know all the communications <coughs> are done digitally but in the presence of noise. So when each of the symbols uh, that are in the particular coding scheme have to be decoded, it is not unambiguous what is the correct decoding because of the influence of the noise. So originally Viterbi used this algorithm to decode something called uh, um, uh, convolution codes, uh, but it's used in telecommunications, it's used in speech recognition, it's used in bioinformatics. So it is really an incredibly wide uh, range of uh, uses, and it's uh, extremely natural, and you almost know it, uh, the algorithm, because uh, if you paid attention when I was teaching 3121, I told you to pay attention to the uh, assembly line uh, problem, right? Uh, so let me first uh, refresh your memory with the assembly line problem. You have uh, two assembly lines with a bunch of workstations, right? And uh, you have times uh, T1, T2, T3, and let's put up an index 1 because it's on the first line. T4, 1, T4, 2. And you have times uh, T1, 2, T2, 2, T2, 3, T2, 4, T2, uh, oops, how did I get? 1, 2, 3, 4, oops, this should be 5, right? It should be T1, T1, right. Sorry? Oops, 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 sorry. Thank you. Right? Uh, and there is no penalty in time to move uh, from one station to the next station on the assembly line, but there is penalty to move across uh, so this is penalty from 1 uh, to 2 on this direction, and this would be so from 1 to 2, and then it would be also time uh, penalty, penalty 2 from 2 to 
one, right? So each, you know the penalties to change the assembly lines. And your task is to find the choice where to do which part of the job so that the total duration of assembly is minimized. You remember this problem? We did it in 3 one to one How do we solve this problem? Yes? Uh, so you look at each station, uh, assume you're at an arbitrary station, and assume that you've solved all the past sub problems. Exactly. And uh, to get to the next station, you either you're either making a choice between uh, staying on the same line and going exactly. across or... Exactly. Yeah. So the solution is this. We consider sub-problems <laughs> to uh, do the job from uh, stations up to I, right? <coughs> and you find the uh, um, fastest way Uh, to get uh, jobs one to I done, but such that the last step is done on line one and uh, a very so this will be problem PI is this, and we will have problems QI, which is exactly the same, but here on line two, right? So how do we get the recursion? Well, to solve, to do first four jobs, and end up here will be whatever is faster to do all the first three jobs ending up here, right? Uh, and continuing straight here, or to do first job, first three jobs ending here, and then transporting and finishing the job here. Right? So this will be. Uh, mean, so let's see, P uh, I is equal to the mean or opt I, opt P I is equal to a mean of opt uh, P I minus one plus time T one i and opt q i minus one plus a penalty from two to one right from i minus one to uh, to i let's write it like this right uh, plus t uh, t t one i Right? And similarly, you get opt QI. Right? So for every, for each of the two workstations, you see what's better. Doing the first three jobs here, and then proceeding immediately here, or doing the first three jobs in a way that finishes here, transporting, and then doing again here. And the same for the other one. Right? So this is essentially the Viterbi algorithm. This is why this is important. So, yes? Um, well, back to speech recognition. Um, what are we trying to maximize? Are we trying to maximize the probability of the mark of the chain? Or are we trying to maximize the probability of the mappings of the observables? To exactly. The you are trying to find for a given set of observables what are, what is the evolution of, Mar of the Markov chain that is most likely to produce such observables? Huh? So we can do it by brute force as follows. For every run of Markov chain, you can compute the probability to have such a run. 
What will be this probability? That's the probability to start um, with this state S1 <coughs> times probability to make the transition from 1 to 2 times probability to make transition from 2 to 3 and so forth. That's the probability of this run. And then times, not only that you have to have such run, but it has to produce the observables times the probability that this produced output O1 times probability that this produced output O2 and so forth. But this would, you would have to scan through all possible runs, which is exponential, right? If it's run of size t, right, then this would be n to the power t. So it would be too hard to see what run of a Markov chain will produce, is most likely to produce the outcome you want, right? So somehow you want an efficient algorithm that tells you which run produces, has a probability of resulting, of being the cause of observables, right? So, for example, uh, say if the phonemes are, let's take a silly example, uh, the phonemes are uh, neg, neg, right? Well, probability of a, uh, to have first phoneme n is large, but from n to go to g will be very small. And what will be then probability that uh, uh, the observables are the feature vectors of i? Uh, I'll say i and then uh, silence. Well, n is extremely unlikely to produce observable outcomes or audible outcomes that uh, uh, sounds like i, right? So in this case, you will have very unlikely sequence producing, uh, resulting in a very unlikely event to have such outcome. So the preferred thing would be something that is reasonably likely as a run, according to the transition probabilities, and these particular states are reasonably likely to produce the audible outcomes that you got. Right? So simply, you, I give you a waveform, and I ask you what was spoken, right? Well, you would try to see which uh, are the phonemes, so that given how likely they are, and given how likely they are to have these observable outcomes, how likely is to get the the outcome that you observed. Are you with me? Good. So let's see. Now you can simply see that the algorithm is a simple generalization of the assembly line algorithm. Because, sorry, let me move here. Let's see. Yep, we have just enough time to finish it up. And you can read it, I'll put the lecture notes. Uh, um, hidden Markov models are ubiquitous in computer science, and they are really worthwhile understanding in knowing about. OK. So, so we are given the sequence of observables O1, O2, up to OT. We are going to solve the following problem. A problem, say, P, uh, I, K is uh, the following. Uh, what is uh, the most likely chain 
of states are S1, S2, up to Si. <coughs> um, okay, uh, maybe I should, uh, uh, let's call them, uh, because we don't know, this is indexing of all states, so uh, x1, x2, up to um, xi, um, uh, to produce uh, observable outcome uh, <coughs> O1, O2, up to OI, assuming such that XI is state uh, S, uh, say, SK. <coughs> so problem PIK is uh, given this observation and assuming that the last state here is SK, right? So we are given the sequence of observation so, and uh, we look at all truncation up to uh, some position i and we want to see how to find uh, uh, what is the most likely state, uh, sequence of states x1 up to xi, but such that the very last moment, mo uh, moment is, uh, sorry, the last state is precisely state k. This is exactly what we did here, right? We found what is the fastest way to get to the first, uh, say, four assembly uh, stages, but ending up here, right? Here we want to find for the given sequence of observations, we want to find a sequence of states that is most likely to produce these observations and that has additional property that the very last one is the state SK. So this is part